This is our theme verse for the year. And so let's say this aloud together. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's from John 10.10. 10. And if you'd like to commit that to memory, you can do so. We're going to be in the book of Exodus this morning. Exodus chapter 16, if you've got your Bibles and would like to turn there. As you're turning to Exodus 16, I don't know if you heard about the, uh, the old cowboy out west. He was driving down the highway. His dog was riding in the back of his truck and his faithful horse was in the trailer behind. And he failed to negotiate a curve and he had a terrible accident. Sometime later, a highway patrol officer came out on the scene. He was an animal lover and he saw the horse first. Realizing the serious nature of its injuries, he drew his service revolver and he put the animal out of its misery. He walked around the accident and found the dog also hurt critically. He couldn't bear to hear it whine in pain and so he ended the dog's suffering as well. Finally, he located the cowboy who suffered multiple fractures, blood all over, laying off in the weeds. The officer said, hey, are you okay? The cowboy took one look at the smoking revolver in the trooper's hand and quickly replied, never felt better. <laughs> We're going to be talking about Exodus 16, and we don't want to complain. We don't want to complain. No matter how much pain we're in, we don't want to complain, right? Well, looking at Moses' life, just an overview real quick, three stages of his life, three 40-year sections. He lived to be 120 years of age. The first 40 years were life in the palace. Things were going well. And then he killed a man and was on, on the run for his life out in the desert of Midian, watching his father-in-law's sheep, 40 years there. And then God comes to him in the burning bush when he's 80, and he asks him to go and deliver the children from Egypt out to the promised land. And that's the last 40 years of Moses' life. And that's where we are right now. And that's the section three there. So Exodus chapter 16, manna and quail. Uh, God provides for his kids. And, and you say, I wish God would provide for me. He has. He is. If you have breath in your lungs and you're listening to this online or you're here in person, God has provided for you. We need to be mindful of that, that God provides for us. So verse 1, let's look at that. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. Now these are Moses' words to us. Moses now 80 years old. He's leading three million Israelites out of bondage, now out into the wilderness to follow around him. Look at verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They've just seen the provision of God letting them out of bondage, separating the Red Sea, and they marched across that 10-mile stretch of dry ground on the bottom of that Red Sea. And they got on the other side, and then God let the walls collapse on them. And now they're out in the wilderness, and now the first thing they do is they go to grumbling and complaining. Grumbling, and in the Hebrew it means to lodge, to stop over, or to pass the night. Isn't that interesting? I would never knew that before until I studied for this sermon that that word grumbling actually means to lodge, to set up camp, to kind of have an attitude like, I'm going to grumble, setting up camp. This is called grumble camp, and this is where I am. And you know, some people can set up camp, and they can grumble, and they can keep on grumbling. That's not where God wants us. God wants us to be a thankful people, and some people spend the whole night there. They just set up camp and they say, we're here. All right, let's go ahead and set up shop here. We're, we're going to grumble, the whole family. Come on, let's all grumble together. No, that's not what God wants us to do. In fact, Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. A lot of people use this for Christian couples that are married. And that's true. You shouldn't let the sun go down on your anger. Sometimes you have to stay up until four in the morning 
trying to work something out, but you're not going to let the sun go down on your anger. You're going to work it out. Sometimes you have to agree to say, can we agree that we're going to work on this tomorrow? And there's some agreement. And a husband and wife can agree to work. Maybe it's so big of a problem they can't handle it one night. But they're agreeing to work on it. And so they, they come together and they say, I'm still mad at you. And I'm mad at you. Say, well, you know what? Let's just pray and ask God to help us to work on this tomorrow. And there's agreement. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. Don't be a murmuring Christian. Don't be a murmuring spouse. Oh, God, if you just give me a better spouse. What? God gave you that spouse on purpose to teach you some things about God. And God gave you to that person to teach them some things too. It, it, it's a, it's a two-way street. I would say this, men, don't go perch on the couch at night when you're mad. Stay in your bed and don't make your wife leave either. You stay there. Say, you know what? No, we're going to work on this. <clears throat> Honey, I am so mad at you. I can hardly talk to you, but we're going to work on this. Okay. Yes, we're going to do that. There's no kiss. There's no hug, but there's an agreement that you're going to work on it. Don't go to the couch. You give the devil a foothold in your marriage relationship. If you're on the couch, husband, go back and get in your bed. Go back and make up with your wife. Don't have a murmuring spirit in your marriage. That can destroy a marriage. And, and the bed's a lot more comfortable than the couch anyway. I'm not speaking from experience. Uh, no. Verse 3, the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. There it is, complaining and murmuring again. A grudge, a resentment, obstinance. You know, I went back because I, I read that. I thought, oh, yeah, I guess God was providing for him, you know, those pots of flesh. But I went back and looked. No. They were mistreated. They were whipped. They were beaten. They were crying out for a Savior. They were not sitting around pots of meat with their feet kicked up and somebody serving them. No, they, they, when we get into trouble, we look back on other things, and, we, and I think it's just selective memory. Selective memory disorder we have sometimes. Don't we? It was so good back then because it's terrible now. Selective memory disorder. We can get that as Christians. Be careful. Um, you had good things back there, but you also had bad things back there, and God was with you in both of them. Give him praise for who he is. I don't know if you heard about the, the man who was stranded on the desert island. And uh, finally, rescuers got to him, and they saw there were three shelters on this little island. And he was the only one there. And they said, well, tell us about these three shelters you put up. And he said, well, this first one is my home, and, and this second one is my church. He said, well, what's the third one? He said, well, that's, that's my former church. Sometimes we can murmur and complain about things at church. Boy, the preacher, he said this, that made me mad. And the Sunday school teacher said this and made me mad. That person didn't shake my hand. That person made me... But we can get into a murmuring place, and that's not a good place to be. We have a lot to murmur about, don't we, with COVID-19? But you know what? We're not going to do it. God is giving us grace to take steps to walk with us even now. Do you think God is surprised right now? Like, oh, Jesus, did you see it? There's a virus down there. I can't believe it. What's going on on earth? No, God is in control. He's seated on a throne, and he knows right where we are. And he is with us, and he's providing for us even now. Do everything without complaining, Ephesians 4.29. Do everything without complaining. Is that even possible? With God, all things are possible. Stop your complaining and give praise to God, even in the midst of terrible times. What a difference that'd make if you go to the office and everybody's talking about, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that, and we got to wear this mask. And you, you know what? God is with us. Isn't he good? Who are you? I'm a Christian, and God is with us. If God is for us, who can be against us? See, that kind of attitude is infectious. Be positive. They did a, a survey of the 500 CEOs in the United States, and there's one quality that all of these CEOs had, positivity. Hmm, wonder why they're CEOs, because nobody wants to be around a crank, right? 
But when you're positive, you'll draw people to you. I think Christians should be the most positive people in the world. Yes, we have problems. Yes, we have issues. Yes, we have broken bones. We have surgery. We have death. But we're positive because we know God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? The people are so quick to impugn Moses' character. They say, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve us. What? God brought them out, not Moses. Don't kill the messenger, right? Look at verses 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So God is giving them very specific instructions. I'm going to provide for you, and on the sixth day, the day before the Sabbath, gather twice as much. And then on that seventh day, you don't have to go out and gather. Provide, you'll, God will provide for you on that sixth day enough for two days. And so they do that. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, God humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Sound familiar? Jesus quoted that to Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness. John 6, 31 through 33. Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. They're talking to Jesus, these Pharisees. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is our true bread. You can be well fed and hollow spiritually. Jesus is your true bread. Parents, you need to teach your kids. It's not just about going to church. It's about a lifelong relationship with Jesus. Do your kids see you reading the Bible? Do your kids see you studying His Word and spending time with Him? I mean, they see you doing other things, which are important to you, and they're okay. There's nothing wrong with doing other activities, but do your kids see you studying God's Word? This is true life. We can teach our kids baseball and sports. We can teach them academics, and we can teach them politics, and we can teach them how to get a great job. But if we don't teach them to take in God's Word, what have we really given to them? And it's not too late. You say, my kids are raised. No, as long as you're alive, they're not raised. You're still raising them. Grandparents, you're still raising your own kids, aren't you? Give them the Word of God. Teach them the value of God's Word. It's God's Word that gives us life and sustenance. Verses 6 through 8, So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because He has heard your grumbling against Him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when He gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because He has heard your grumbling against Him. Moses says again, Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Folks, when we grumble, we're not grumbling against our job, against our spouse, against our kids, against COVID. We're grumbling against the Lord. We're saying, God, I don't like what's going on. It's your fault, and I hate it. And we're really slapping God in the face with those words. Be careful. God is providing for us. God is providing for you even today. Remember Korah's rebellion in number 16? They complained against the leaders of Israel. They complained against Moses, and God opened up the ground and over 15,000 people died that day as they were swallowed up in the earth and the ground closed back up. It was a supernatural phenomenon that God provided as they were complaining against God's servants. Be careful about complaining against spiritual authority in your life. You may not like them, but take it to God, right? If my breath stinks and I bother you, and take it to God, right? I'm God's servant to you. I'm fallible. I'm like you. I am fallible. I need God's grace every day, just like you. If I've offended you, please come and talk to me. Don't talk against me. I don't know that anybody is, but if you are, come and talk to me. I want to be approachable. Uh, uh, people get upset at me for something I said. I didn't even mean it. And, I, and boy, I think, boy, how did, I, how did that come across? But I'm sorry. 
And I'll apologize to you. I'm not here to say I'm right, you're wrong. I want us to have peace in the church. So if there's ever a time that Satan starts needling you and saying, well, that preacher, well, that pastor, be careful. Be careful. Come and talk to me. Let's do it that way. Let's do it, let's do it grown-up way. Let's just let's do it right, right? You all for that? Amen? Let's just do it right. Korah's rebellion teaches us not to touch God's anointed. Look at Romans. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Whew, that's a heavy, heavy scripture. I don't know if you saw this. A heavy wagon was being dragged along a country lane by a team of oxen. The axle trees groaned and creaked terribly, whereupon the oxen, turning round, thus addressed the wheels. Hello there. Why do you make so much noise? We bear all the labor, and we, not you, ought to cry out. So what's the moral of that little story? Those who suffer most cry out the least. It's those of us who can't really, we don't have much suffering going on. We complain all the time. But those who suffer the most cry out the least. Look at verses 9 and 10. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. Can you imagine being out there and you see the glory? What is glory? It means weight, it means majesty, it means splendor. There was something different. The cloud was always leading them, but now the glory of God came and was in the cloud, and they looked and they saw the glory of God in the cloud. I don't know how to describe glory, but some of you have been in services, I have too, where you sense the glory of God, you sense the power of God, you sense conviction, and you sense there's something different, and you don't walk out of here and go watch your football and eat your, your, your lunch. You go to your face in prayer. And you say, God, I've got to have more of you. The glory of God was present in the sanctuary today. And God, I want more of you in my life. These other things aren't giving me life. Lord, I need you. We need the glory of God in the sanctuary, don't we? We want the glory. Pray. Pray with me. We'll pray together. God, bring down your glory into this place. Church, we need something fresh, don't we? We need, we need the power and the glory of God in us. Moms and dads, in your marriage relationship, in your parenting, in your grandparents, we need the glory of God. Don't you want more of God in your life? We want more of God, more of God, the glory of God in our lives. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. That's from Genesis 30 or 22, whenever uh, God provides that lamb. And so Abraham doesn't have to sacrifice his son Isaac. Jehovah Jireh, that's Hebrew, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Look at verses 11 and 12. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. God's getting ready to do something. He's getting ready to show them His glory and His power. Verse 13, That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Quail came and covered... As I read about this, I understood that the, the, uh, these quail would migrate. They'd go from Europe to Arabia and then back. They'd kind of travel back and forth, and they'd have to cross over this promised land that they're walking through. And as they'd go by, they were so tired. The birds, the quail were so tired, they'd fly low. And even a, a nimble boy, as I read some Jewish literature on this, a nimble boy could run and catch a quail with his hand. And the children of Israel had all these quail coming through there, just about this high, and they could all just start grabbing birds. I saw one on YouTube. I thought, is that true? I look it up on YouTube, and there's a guy, he's walking by, and a quail coming by, and he just goes, Phew, grabs it right out of the air. Doesn't even need a dog to hunt. He just grabs that quail right out of the air. That's what God does. He brings in this great group of birds migrating through, and the children of Israel have so much quail, they don't even know what to do with it. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. That's a lot of quail. They had so much quail, they got sick of it. In fact, they were complaining, and there's another place in Psalms where it talks about that while the sturdiest of them were chewing the quail and they're still grumbling, God struck them down. God provided for them, and they're still complaining. God has provided for them, and they're still complaining. God has provided for us. We shouldn't complain. 
Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, he said this. He had complete trust in God's faithful provision. He wrote in his journal, Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced one. He knows very well that His children wake up with a good appetite every morning. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. We do not expect that He will send three million missionaries to China, but if He did, God would have ample means to sustain them all. Depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Think about the church. We'll never have need if we're doing it His way. Verses 13 through 15. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given to you to eat. If you're going to say, What is it? in Hebrew, you would say, Manna. Manna. What is it? And so they called this bread on the floor of the desert, what is it? Because they didn't know. God supernaturally provided for His children through the manna. Manna, what is it? God provided and the people gathered. Don't miss this. This is huge for our society. God provided, the people gathered. You see that? God provided, but the people still had to do something. They had to gather. They didn't just sit there like birds, little baby birds, and God dropped manna in their mouth. What I'm saying is you can help somebody so much that you rob their dignity. People can work. We don't believe in welfare, right? We believe in workfare. The church believes in workfare. Paul said in the Bible, if a man does not work, he shall not eat. God knows that that will rob our dignity. So God provided for them, and they gathered don't give your kids everything they want. Show them where it is and show them how to get there, but let them work their way. Give them a good work ethic. That's Christianity. You've got to work. Not everything can be handed to you. We're not a socialistic world. That's, that's not who we are. We believe God provides, and then we gather, right? Some of you agree with that. If you don't, try raising teens where you just give them everything you want. You'll have some spoiled barats in your home. You teach them here it is, now you go get it. No, I'm not going to get you a drink, you can get it on your own. I don't know, Scott, should I tell him that story? No, all right, tell me, see me afterwards, it's a great story, probably you've heard it. I've got to tell you, no? All right, he said yes. <clears throat> he was driving around, he and his wife, we're going to go out on a Friday night, I guess it was, Saturday night, go get a meal. They're driving, and their two daughters in the back, and they were kind of, wah, 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 complaining, where are we going, we always go there, wah, wah. Scott had had enough. Scott turned that car around, drove back to his house, and said, get out of the car. What, Daddy? Get out of the car. You're not going. Daddy, what, what are we going to eat? Figure it out. Shut the door. He and Susan went off and had a great meal together. <laughs> Ever since, those girls were so thankful to be able to go with them wherever they went. Good job, Scott. That's called being a parent, and that's what we need to do as Christians. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Give us this day our daily bread. That's Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, our spiritual sustenance as well. Look at 17 and 18. The Israelites did as much as they were told. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, each gathered as much and did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Hmm, it's interesting. Verse 19, then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. Don't keep any manna in your house. Eat up what you need. Don't try to store it. Don't get a pantry going, okay? Each one gathers as much as he needed. Don't be greedy, right? He's teaching him something. Don't worry. God will provide for you. Don't break your neck trying to get rich. God will provide for you. You're working eight days a week. Stop it. God will provide for you. Trust him. Trust him. Verse 20, interesting. However, this is a bad however. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. All of a sudden, you start to know you're walking out of your camp the next morning out of your tent. And you're walking, and you go, what's that smell? Oh, they didn't obey. 
Oh, you didn't either. You'd smell it. It's a stench in the camp. It turned to maggots. They, they had to throw it. They didn't listen. They didn't obey. And so it made Moses angry. Verses 21 through 26. We're closing in here. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as he needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be there will be there will not be any. But some of them went out. I'm just gonna go ahead and read that. Nevertheless, some of the people, verse 27, they went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. God said, there'll be nothing on the Sabbath. Just gather enough on the sixth day for both days, and you'll be okay. There'll be nothing out there. So God didn't provide any manna on the seventh day because he provided it for them on the sixth day. Look at 27 through 30, 28, 28. The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is until the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. It's good to rest. I think for our culture, we need to hear the first part. Work six days. <laughs> rest on the seventh. Work six days. Now, in America, we get two days, don't we? We got a weekend, right? We get a Saturday or Sunday. But God says, work six days and rest on the seventh. There's something about putting in a good full week of work. There's something about doing your job. There's something about showing up, not just when your boss is watching, but showing up and doing your job, doing it with all your heart as a working for the Lord, not for men. Christians, we can get lazy and we kind of just kind of fall into this malaise. We've got to be careful. He wants us to work six days and rest well. He wants us to rest on the seventh. God provided manna for 40 years. And then when they crossed over into the promised land, it's interesting. As soon as they crossed over, look at this. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they are of the pro they ate of the produce of the Canaanites. I mean, the day they come in, God's provided for them. No more manna. No more manna. God provided for them all 40 years. Some concluding thoughts, concluding thoughts about God's provision. Here they are. What, what do you Christians worry about the most? I looked this up. What do Christians worry about the most? Number four, kids and money. Number three, health. Number two, job. Number one, money. This is from Pew Research. What do Christians worry about the most? There it is. I don't know where you fall on that list, how Satan tries to torment you. But can I tell you something? God is our provider. Do I have enough money in my IRA? Yeah, if God's your God, you do. Well, do I need to put more in? If God gives you more to put in, put it in. Just don't be greedy. Don't think that you've got to provide for yourself. God will provide for you. You do the work and let God accumulate that stuff for you. Be smart. Be smart, but don't let your IRA become an idol. Oh, I lost my IRA. Now there's no God. The same God that helped you put that IRA together is still the God of this universe. He provides for us. Be smart. God gives us a brain. Use your brain, but don't let your money become your idol, right? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. We, we sang about this and even read it. God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He'll provide all that we need, all that we need. <laughs> Deuteronomy 8.18. Look at this, $100 bill. Did you know this was written on the back of it? I wish it was. But remember the Lord your God, for, he, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It's God that gives you the, the ability to produce wealth. So trust in him. I want to read you a final story here. George Mueller had the orphanage. You remember in Bristol? The children are dressed and ready for school, but there's no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. George asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. George thanked God for the food and waited. Within minutes, a baker knocked at the door. 
Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. It was just enough for the 300 thirsty children. Do you worry much? Let me ask you this. Do you pray much? If you're worrying all the time, you probably need to start praying more. Every time you go to worrying, just go to prayer. God, thank you for taking care of this. Lord, thank you for the way you're going to provide for me. Lord, thank you for my family. Thank you for this. Thank you. Just become a thankful person. Let it be the accent of your tongue. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who eats will never die. We need Jesus. If we have Jesus, we have all that we ever need, right? If we have Jesus, he's enough. He is our provider and he provides for you today. God cares for you. He watches out for you. And he's going to provide for you this week, just like he did last week. Is it what you, exactly what you want? Maybe not, but it's what God wants to give you. Will you be thankful in that moment? Will you be thankful in this moment? Let's stand together for a closing prayer.